Last Thanksgiving, I went to the bathroom. <laughs> as all great stories begin. And as I looked down into the toilet, I saw Advil. One of my family members, in trying to open the bottle, dropped some on the floor and decided to throw it into the toilet and flush it down. So it would be gone, but obviously forgot to flush. And for me, I come from a family where our parents always challenged my brothers and I to think critically. My dad, for instance, loved to give us logic problems that required us to think creatively, find clever solutions to problems that you might not see initially. So when I looked down at that toilet and I saw those pills, I thought, what happens when they get flushed down the drain? And the very next semester, I met Dr. Erica Schultz, a brand new chemistry professor right here at Lake Forest College, whose research was into pharmaceuticals and the water supply. And I have been lucky enough to work with her ever since. In my initial research, I was surprised by two things. One is that 90% of the pharmaceuticals that we intake end up into the water supply, whether we flush them down the drain or not. And the other is the damage that those pharmaceuticals do in the water supply. Birth control, for instance, is responsible for premature adolescence in humans, as well as turning male fish and frogs female, making mating very difficult and causing declines in their populations. Anti-inflammatory drugs are responsible for huge declines in scavenger bird populations, such as vultures, and there's no telling what behavioral changes have occurred in animals and humans because of the antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs currently in our water supply. Now, for those of you who don't think about this daily like I do, I wanted to be clear about a few things. First, when I say 90% of pharmaceuticals that you intake end up in the water supply, I don't mean that the pills are still floating out there in Lake Michigan. What I mean is that the chemical inside of the pharmaceutical that's responsible for its function is still intact and active where it's not supposed to be. And I know that this is starting to sound a lot like chemistry. That hated subject for so many high school and college students that seems designed to be incomprehensible and impossible to understand. But I promise you, that when you say it the right way, chemistry makes sense and is amazing in so many different ways. So to that effect, I've made this talk designed specifically so that anybody listening to it can get something out of it. I appreciate it. So instead of showing complex chemical structures that so many people will say, no, 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 to. I'm instead going to be explaining chemical reactivity and the breakdown of these molecules using Jenga blocks. And we'll get to that. But with all of this out of the way, let's talk about this problem, why it's a problem, and what the solution to it might be by taking the journey of the pharmaceutical pill when it gets flushed down the drain. So when pharmaceuticals, or anything really, goes to the sewage system, it ends up in a water treatment plant, like the one on screen. And in it, you can see tanks of varying sizes and shapes filled with water and sewage, but more importantly, bacteria. The most important part of all of this, because bacteria are like little microscopic factories that have been designed through evolution to be able to find this, the weakest part of every organic molecule and break it down. And to explain this, I'm going to show you a Jenga block. And what you're about to see, my hand, when, I, when we took this video, is representing the bacterial mechanism that finds the weakest part. 
where, and the Jenga block represents the molecule that is breaking down. You can see it now. And bacteria do this for so many different molecules. But why not pharmaceuticals? Pharmaceutical companies know all of this. And they know that the same bacteria are in us. So what they do is they take that weakest group that the bacteria can find, and they modify it chemically, adding some group that bacteria don't know how to deal with because they've never been encountered with it. And when they do that, it looks like this, where the modified group prevents the bacteria from finding the weakest part and causing the whole thing to collapse. And that's a good thing because then it goes through our bodies unchanged with its function and we get to reap the benefits. But the consequence of that is that we excrete these compounds unchanged. They go through the sewage system unchanged. They end up in the water treatment plant with the same bacteria that don't know how to deal with it, unchanged, go through, end up in our water supply with the same function but not where they're supposed to be. So what's the solution to this? Because the problem's clear. It's the group that the pharmaceutical company put on there. And we can't just say, all right, pharmaceutical companies, you're not allowed to put those groups on there anymore. Because then they would just break down in our bodies and we wouldn't reap any of the benefits. So instead, what the Schultz lab is hoping to do, and, have start, and has started to do, to do, is to modify that group that the pharmaceutical companies put on there in the water treatment plant. And because we're working in an environment with bacteria, <laughs> we fall under the lens of biocompatible chemistry which just means chemistry that doesn't harm or kill life. And this relatively new field of chemistry um, is used for a variety of reasons. Everything from tumor imaging, using firefly enzymes, to adding chemicals into bacteria so that they can perform new chemical reactions without changing their DNA. But for us, it's really important that we're biocompatible because if our reactions that we design end up being toxic to the bacteria and they die, then nothing will get broken down in the water treatment plant. And we're going to have a far greater problem on our hands than just pharmaceuticals in the water supply. So. Sounds like a good idea, but there's a lot of limitations with it because we have to reverse engineer this process that the pharmaceutical companies did under completely different limitations. Pharmaceutical labs run by the pharmaceutical companies fall under regular organic chemistry reactions where the limitations are really their imagination. They can run a reaction at any condition, at any temperature, with any solvent, the solvent being the liquid that the reaction takes place in, and that can be anything from nail polish remover to water to gasoline. And now we have to take that group off or chemically modify that group under a lot of, of limitations. Our reactions have to be done in neutral conditions, no hotter than body temperature, with our only solvent being water. But even with these limitations, this research has a lot of promise. In our lab, we currently have multiple reactions that are working in the conditions I just presented on. And we hope in the coming years to be able to compile multiple biocompatible reactions together, hand it off to a chemical engineer at a water treatment plant so that they can pick the best one 
to scale up and start reducing the concentration of, of certain pharmaceuticals in the water supply. This problem, this whole situation, is a perfect example of how in so many aspects of our life, when we encounter a problem, we would just want to take everything that's causing the problem away. So many articles you'll read on the subject say that we need to stop using pharmaceuticals. Limit your pharmaceutical use. If you come close to a pharmaceutical, run. Without seeing all the great things that these pills do. And the amazing thing about humans is our ability to innovate, think creatively, find clever solutions to problems, whether that problem is scientific or personal. So let me leave you with this. The next time you encounter a problem with options you don't like, think critically and find a new one. Thank you.